Hi everyone, I'm Carola Binder. I'm an economics professor at Haverford College and I've prepared some slides on a topic that's very important to me and that is writing and economics. So something that I tell my students in almost all of my classes is that of course I hope that from my classes they're going to learn about economics. They're going to learn to become economists. But more important than that to me is that they learn how to write well. And I say this because while some of my students may become economists, all of them will need to write and will need to communicate no matter what they do. Now, ideally, an economics education should also make you a better writer and a better communicator because it teaches you precision of thought. The kinds of models that we teach um, in economics are supposed to force you to be coherent and clear in your arguments. Um, but unfortunately, we often don't teach writing very well, um, if at all, in economics classes. So often, um, you know, I've taught classes ranging from intro level to the senior thesis, and even students who are brilliant economists still struggle to, um, to write well and to communicate well. So I am hoping that the next couple of videos that I will be sharing um, will give you some principles to help you make to help you write better, to be a good writer in economics. Often also the writing seminars, the kinds of first year writing courses that students take are not geared for any particular subject. And while there are some principles of good writing that apply across fields, there are also things that are specific to economics that I wanna go over. So to get started, let me just share with you some resources. Most of what I am drawing from in, in these next slides is um, Dudenheffer's A Guide to Writing and Economics. It's a really good um, PDF book that you can find online. Um, Dudenheffer himself uh, was a um, writing tutor for um, economists at a, at a different college. Um, so it's a very useful guide. Um, another well-known guide is Deirdre McCloskey's Economical Writing. And then um, Joseph Williams' book, Style, 10 Lessons in Clarity and Grace, um, that's going to be useful whether you're an economist or not. So that's more of, of a broad guide to good writing. OK, so again, why, why is it important to write well? Um, well, writing is thinking. So writing helps you think through the details of your arguments. If you're forced to write them down, you're going to have to be more precise than if you're just thinking them through in your head or even verbalizing them to someone else. An argument might sound good in your head until you try to write it out. And if you don't know what to write, so if you're trying to write a paper and you don't know what to write, you haven't thought about enough or researched your topic enough. Okay, so you need to think in order to write and you need to write in order to think. Um, so I mentioned Deirdre McCloskey's book and one thing she says is that the main cause of bad writing in economics is that economists don't read good writing. If economists would read Jane Austen or George Orwell or even Adam Smith or Thomas Schelling in bulk daily habitually, they would improve. And the picture in case you're wondering is Jane Austen and not Deirdre McCloskey. Um, so I agree. I mean, most of how I learned to write was through reading a lot and a lot of a lot of fiction. Um, but even if you're not going to do a lot of reading of good writing or, um, you know, to add to that, we can talk explicitly about some principles of good writing. So again, drawing from Dudenheffer's book, um, he discusses six principles of clear cohesive and coherent writing. And we'll go through each of these in this, in this first video. The first principle is to keep your complete grammatical subjects short. Dudenheffer notes that readers like to get past the subject to the verb as quickly as possible. So structure your sentences so they, that they have the complete grammatical subjects that are short. And here's two examples of the same sentence. So the first one has a long subject. It says, a full explanation of why the model cannot accommodate this particular case of omitted variable bias is given in the appendix. What's the subject? 
It's this whole part, a full explanation of why the model cannot accommodate this particular case of omitted variable bias. Okay, that's the subject. And then the verb is, is given in the appendix. So you can hear how the subject is very long. Okay, now let's contrast that to the version at the bottom with the short subject. The appendix explains in full why the model cannot accommodate this particular case of omitted variable bias. What's the subject in this case? The appendix. Okay, then the verb clause is a longer part here. Explains in full, da da da. So hopefully you can tell that the short subject version is clearer and easier to read. A reader would like the second version with the short subject better. Here's um, another an example that Dudenheffer provides by George Stigler, um, very renowned economist, um, writing in 1964. This is good examples of keeping the subject short. No one has the right and few the ability to lure economists into reading another article on oligopoly theory without some advanced indication of its alleged contribution. So did you see the subjects? No one. View. Okay. The present paper accepts the hypothesis that oligopolists wish to collude to maximize joint profits. It seeks to reconcile this wish with facts, such as that collusion is impossible for many firms and collusion is much more effective in some circumstances than others. The reconciliation is found in the problem of policing occlusive argument, which proves to be a problem in the theory of information. Okay, so read through that, you can see how all of the subjects are short. And I think it's no coincidence that Stigler, a brilliant economist, was also an excellent writer. Moving on to the second principle, number two, express key actions as verbs. Okay, we often hide key actions in abstract nouns or nominalizations. So nominalizations are noun forms of words that can also be verbs. Some examples are analysis from analyze, assumption from assume, and resistance from resist. You can find nominalizations because they tend to end in shun, mint, ints. So it's those kind of words, analysis, assumption, resistance. Okay, so here's again some examples the same, expressing the same sentence, but with or without nominalizations. Let's look at the first. There is opposition among many voters to nuclear power plants right here. Okay, the, the nominalization, opposition. But another alternative is many voters oppose nuclear power plants. The difference there is instead of using the nominalization opposition, which forces you to use that um, there is at the beginning, we're using the verb just oppose. And then we can directly say who is doing the opposing. Many voters oppose. See, that's a lot shorter and a lot clearer than there is opposition among many voters. Next example, economists made attempts to define full employment. The better version, without the nominalization is just economists attempted to define full employment. We use the verb attempt instead of made attempts. Okay, we conducted a review of the matter versus we reviewed the matter. Um, I think a lot of times students might at first think that it actually sounds better to write, we conducted a review of the matter, or they might write that because they're trying to lengthen out their paper or to, to sound more sophisticated with longer kinds of words. Um, but really, longer is not better. You wanna say things as concisely as possible usually. So re we reviewed the matter is better than we conducted a review of the matter. The last two examples, the model makes the assumption that people engage in utility maximization. Compare that to just the model assumes that people maximize their utility. Okay, that had two nominalizations in the first case, assumption and maximization, which we replaced with the verbs assume and maximize. And then last, there is need for further study of the problem compared to we need to study the problem further. As in the first example, you can, 
you, you can identify the sentence starts with there is. Okay, when a sentence starts with there is, that should clue you in that you can probably improve the sentence. Okay, so using this principle too about avoiding nominalizations by using verbs instead, take a minute to try to rewrite this sentence. Writing that demonstrates a reliance on nominalizations is often the result of a misguided desire to make an impression on the readers. There's a lot of possible answers here, but when you're, um, but what you ought to try to do is find the nominalizations. So reliance, can you replace that with relies or rely? Um, and the result, can it come from the verb results? Um, make an impression, could that just be impress? Okay. So um, look at your sentence that you wrote. And if you still have those nominalizations in there, then just pause the video and take another few minutes and see if you can rewrite it, replacing all of those nominalizations with verbs. So here's an example of how you could have done it. Writers often rely on nominalizations when they want to impress their readers. The third principle that Dudenheffer provides is to begin sentences with old information. Let's look at these versions of the same little paragraph, 1a and 1b, and think about which flows better. So first, just listen to me reading them. An effective way to write sentences that flow is to use the rhetorical device known as conduplicatio. To repeat a key word or phrase from a preceding sentence, especially when the word or phrase comes at the end of the preceding sentence, is to use conduplicatio. Now here's the other way. An effective way to write sentences that flow is to use the rhetorical device known as conduplicatio. Conduplicatio repeats a key word or phrase from a preceding sentence, especially when the word or phrase comes at the end of the preceding sentence. Okay, the one that should have sounded like it flows better is 1b, the second one, um, because it has that conduplicatio. You see how the, the first sentence there ends in conduplicatio, a rhetorical device known as conduplicatio. The next sentence starts off with that same idea. Conduplicatio repeats a word or phrase from a preceding sentence. Okay, so it just um, allows the two thoughts to better be connected. Um, what is old information exactly? So it doesn't need to be the exact word or phrase that was said before. Um, sometimes there'll be some sort of connector or transitional word or phrase that lets the reader know how one sentence is connected to the sentence that came before it. So you might see things like, for example, thus, however, in contrast. The point is that you should begin your sentences with a piece of information that tells the reader how it relates to the sentences that just preceded it. You want to make the logical flow easy for them to grasp. The fourth principle is to end sentences with new information. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we just talked about that you should begin sentences with old information. Now, it's also a good idea to end them with new information, information that they haven't encountered yet or couldn't anticipate. And this new information tends to be the most important part of your sentence. So it's what you want to emphasize the most. The place of most emphasis in a sentence is the end, okay? Um, so now we'll just um, move on to the fifth principle, which is to make the subjects of your sentences the person, place, or thing that the sentence is about. Here's two different, um, two different small paragraphs. They have pretty similar information content, but let's read them and see the difference, okay? The first says, omitted variable bias has plagued studies of student achievement. It has prevented researchers from reaching confident conclusions about the best way 
to reform the education system. Okay. In this, this little paragraph, the story is about omitted variable bias. And the sentences started with omitted variable bias and with it, which is referring to omitted variable bias. No, the second paragraph, it, it's about the same thing, but the story is, is different. So listen, educational researchers have long been stimmied by the problem of omitted variable bias. They therefore cannot be confident that their studies yield reliable conclusions about the best way to reform the education system. In this case, the sentences start with educational researchers and they, which again refers to educational researchers. So this story is about educational researchers. Even though both of these little stories are about omitted variable bias and education research. So let's look at these three sentences and you think for a minute about which sentence is best. The first, Gary Becker was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1992. The next, the 1992 Nobel Prize for Economics was awarded to Gary Becker. The third, the year 1992 saw Gary Becker win the Nobel Prize for Economics. Okay, think about which sentence um, might be best. Okay, this was a little bit of a trick question because um, none of the three sentences is best unless I tell you what we're actually writing about. So it depends. Okay, if, if you were writing a biography of Gary Becker, the first would be the best because you're starting with the subject of that story, Gary Becker. If you wanted to write about Nobel Prizes in 1992, then the second option would be the best. If you were writing about the events of the year 1992, um, say for some, some sort of uh, world book or something, you would pick sentence number three, okay? So the subject of the sentence um, and the beginning of the sentence should match what your story that you're telling is about. Okay, the sixth um, principle here is to make the first few words of your sentences constitute a limited set of concepts. What does, what does this mean? Well, if you start your sentences with old information, as we talked about, you'll create a passage that flows. That means that it's cohesive, but it might not necessarily be coherent. So let's look at this paragraph, which does use that, um, that other principle, so beginning sentences with old information, um, but it's not necessarily coherent. Saner, Wisconsin is the snowmobile capital of the world. The buzzing of snowmobile engines fills the air and their tank-like tracks crisscross the snow. The snow reminds me of mom's mashed potatoes covered with furrows that I would draw with my fork. Her mashed potatoes usually make me sick, which is why I play with them. I like to make a hole in the middle of the potatoes and fill it with melted butter. Butter is good on rolls too. Okay, used can duplicatio, but it just sounds like a rambling stream of consciousness. Like you're going from one thought to the next with one thing kind of reminds you of something else. It's rambling because the subjects of the sentences don't demonstrate a consistent pattern. Um, so at the, at the bottom of the, of the um, slide here, we have the beginning of each sentence and they each have different new information. Saner, Wisconsin, the buzzing of snowmobile engines, the snow, her mashed potatoes, I like to make a hole, butter is good on rolls, okay. Um, new information followed by new information followed by new information and it becomes quite incoherent. Um, okay, so let's try another passage. The particular ideas toward the beginning of sentences define what a passage is about for a reader. Moving through a paragraph from a cumulatively coherent point of view is made possible by a sequence of topics that seem to constitute a limited set of related ideas. The seeming absence of context for each sentence is one consequence of making random shifts in topics. Feelings of dislocation, disorientation, and lack of focus in a passage occur when that happens. This passage, again, is probably going to strike you as incoherent. Why? Again, look at the first few words in each sentence. The particular idea is toward the beginning. Moving through a paragraph. A seeming absence of context. Feelings of dislocation. So the string of words that begin each sentence is inconsistent. That means our attention is not focused on a limited set of ideas. That's hard for a reader to deal with. Okay. 
readers, we have limited attention span. So um, it's just, it's hard if you're switching um, how you're starting each sentence. Okay, finally, a third example. Readers look for the topics of sentences to tell them what a whole passage is about. If they feel that its sequence of topics focuses on a limited set of related topics, they will feel they are moving through the passage from a cumulatively coherent point of view. But if topics seem to shift randomly from sentence to sentence, then readers have to begin each sentence from no consistent point of view. And when that happens, readers feel dislocated, disoriented, and the passage seems out of focus. This, this time, this should seem a lot more coherent. It's about the same thing as the last paragraph that we read, but this time the words that begin each sentence focus on a limited set of concepts, readers, topics, passage. And the grammatical subjects are short, which was one of the earlier principles that we talked about. Okay, so those were the six principles from Duden Heffer, and all the examples um, and explanations came from him. Um, but there's a few other principles um, that I've kind of gathered from other sources. So I'll go through a couple of those. What I'm calling the seventh is to use parallel construction. Um, now this came from a Washington University faculty website. Um, the link is at the bottom there. Okay, so use parallel construction. What this means is that when two or more parts of a sentence are parallel in meaning, you should make them parallel in form, okay? And in this case, uh, there's some examples that were not parallel construction, not using parallel construction, and then they're crossed out. So you can see how um, they would be written with parallel construction. The allies de decided to invade Italy, and then that they would launch a massive assault on the Normandy coast. This is not parallel construction because the first, first here we have to invade Italy. So then we want also to say, then to launch a massive assault. Okay, so to invade, to launch, makes it parallel. Um, some more examples. I like swimming, skiing, and to hike in the mountains. Not parallel, because the first two verbs there, and then I and G, don't have a to, and the last, they've, made, they've said to hike. Okay, so better to say, I like swimming, skiing, and hiking in the mountains. Um, another example, either we must make nuclear power safe or we must stop using it. We said we must before make, so we say we must before stop. Um, another part of using parallel construction is that in sentences made with correlatives, each correlative goes just before one of the parallel items. It's easiest to explain this through examples. The more I see of men, I find dogs more likable. That's not parallel construction. The more I see of men, the more likable, or the more I find dogs likable. That would be parallel construction. Okay. Let's look at the one at the bottom here. They fought in the streets, the fields, and in the woods. They put in before the streets and before the woods, but not before the fields. You want to have, if you're going to use in before um, some of these items in the list, you need it before all. So they fought in the streets, in the fields, and in the woods. The eighth principle here is to use active voice as opposed to passive voice. Active voice example would be the board of directors decided to fire you. Passive voice, it was decided that you would be fired. You see in the second, it's passive voice um, because we have this, this subject, it, you know, it was decided. Well, who decided that? The, the active voice version tells us who did the deciding. The board of di directors decided. So you can get rid of passive voice by getting rid of um, it is blank that. So it is, um, it is nice that you're listening to my video. Or it was, like it was decided. There is, there are, there was, and there were. Those usually come before using passive voice. Um, you can go through your writing, find those, and um, most of the time it's going to be better to go in and replace them with active voice, where you're telling the reader 
who is doing the verb. Okay, so the next video that I'll make is going to be um, writing about numbers. So thank you for watching this one, and um, I'll uh, well I'll show you another video soon. Bye.